So as I, as I told you yesterday, uh, the lectures that we are talking about here will, was that lecture one and two was about isolated or driven Hamiltonian quantum optical systems. And uh, today I would like to switch over to open quantum optical systems. And I thought that I will sort of divide my talk into two parts. The first one is a more uh, pedagogical side corresponding to the fact that I'm supposed to give an introduction to quantum optics. I guess that all of you know the master equations, you have heard a lot about quantum trajectory and all of these things. And I would like to give you um, a derivation of some of these things coming from a somewhat different angle, uh, which is an intermediate step or sort of has as a starting point, not the stochastic, but the quantum stochastic Schrodinger equation. There's all of these things in the background like Ito calculus, quantum Ito calculus and all of that. We will not talk about these things from this mathematical point of view, but I would like to give you a hands-on derivation how people coming from continuous measurement would sort of make a connection with what we do in quantum optics. And this is the third, uh, first part that we have over here. And then I had in mind to give you two examples, and I guess that for the second one, I'm sort of decided this morning that I will be running out of time, so I put it in parentheses over here. Um, maybe some of you have heard um, these um, ideas about what's called chiral quantum systems or cascading quantum systems. They have interesting applications in a quantum information context. Um, uh, we actually wrote recently a review together with experimentalists about some of these things where we put some theory perspective also in. And so I would like as an, as an example, sort of an extension, you know, coming from this discussion to we'll talk about these things here and a little bit of prospects and in doing that, I will give you some underlying theory, talk about this cascaded uh, master equation, for example, uh, how to derive you know, from these first principles here, and then give you certain examples, but uh, the end will be short, and I guess probably will not have time in the last part. So in this sense, this is kind of the outline of uh, what the lecture will be here today. So um, all of you sort of know, and I'm kind of saying the obvious, that what we have in quantum optics is very often a situation or always the situation where we have a system of interest. And uh, in the following discussion, they really simplify these things down because uh, it applies to all quantum optical systems. But let's be a little bit more specific in the pedagogical sense. Uh, let's take as a system here a two-level system which we drive. This is the most simple thing that we can think of, and it is sufficient for illustrating the ideas. And we couple our systems, first of all, to a laser, a classical drive, indicated here by this Ravi frequency. Uh, but, of course, uh, atoms, at least in the optical domain, are always coupled to a bath, which is represented by the vacuum modes of the radiation field, so there will be spontaneous emission. And all of you know, of course, uh, the story, and probably have seen it several times, that at the end of the day, we write down for the reduced density matrix of the system over here, this master equation, okay? So I would like to talk about uh, this kind of a setting here, but uh, from a somewhat um, you know, different perspective. If you open books on quantum information theory, there's all of these things about quantum operation, as, uh, uh, for example, uh, Niels and Chang call it, uh, Gauss operators and uh, um, POVMs and so on, this formal quantum information theory language. And uh, what I would like to do in the lecture today is sort of uh, take this thing as a starting point and make a connection to what we do in quantum optics. And uh, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know the quantum stochastic uh, Schrodinger equation. Quantum is important here. This is not the stochastic Schrodinger equation, but quantum. And uh, I would like to derive that and then from sort of there, you know, to derive uh, what we know in quantum optics like master equation, all of these things. In principle, as I said, there's a lot of uh, theoretical uh, or mathematical things to be said here related to Ito calculus for this, uh, this quantum Ito calculus. We will sort of do these things by just you know, playing with our equations and then the end say, well, there's a connection here, so I will not try to really emphasize this connection with quantum Ito here very much. It will be kind of a side product, but actually what we do is, uh, at the end, the connection between the Stratonovich and the Ito calculus and the quantum level and writing down these equations for experts. So this is sort of the outline, and uh, you should really understand this thing as being a kind of a pedagogical you know, um, uh, viewpoint of uh, trying to connect uh, different worlds here together and learn something about a problem that all of you probably know to some extent from a slightly different perspective. So if you open a book on quantum information, uh, like uh, Nielsen and Chuang, 
uh, then uh, called quantum information, quantum computation. Then uh, there will be a chapter, or there is a chapter in there that talks about what they call quantum operation. I've just used their, their language over here. And uh, what they're interested in in this context is that, of course, we also, as I just explained in quantum optics, that we have a system of interest which is coupled to an environment. And in the quantum information context, this is usually very important uh, because this amounts to having decoherence. But uh, we will say later on that, of course, in quantum optics, we often want to play with this environment in introducing by hand interesting decoherence uh, in the form of engineered dissipation that does certain interesting tasks. And you will see examples of these things uh, later on if I am able to go to the second part. So what's the idea behind this quantum operation? Well, it's sort of the, the obvious here. We have a system of interest and uh, some initial time. This is in a product state. Let me assume for the moment, just for simplicity really here, that the environment is in a pure state. The reason why this is good for what I would like to do is that afterwards the environment will be the optical electromagnetic field and there's no thermal photons in the optical electromagnetic field. So this will be just a vacuum state and it is a pure state and it allows me to simplify some of these formulas that appear over here. So suppose that you have some time evolution of a system, you know, this is your system of interest. And um, you may want to, or maybe not to, couple to this environment over here, indicated by some unitary operator. So if you look at the system after a certain amount of time, you know, what will come out is the reduced density matrix for the system over here. For example, here we are looking uh, at the situation. This is an open quantum system, a system coupled to an environment. Um, but we are, for example, not observing or not measuring, at least at the moment, uh, the environment that we have over here. So the quantity of interest is really the reduced density operator of the system up here alone. And so we have now a map from the initial density operator evolving over a certain time to the output density oper uh, operator indicated by over here. And uh, if you start writing this thing down, let me assume that initially my system is in a product state of this vacuum state, as I said before, this pure state and your uh, system state that you put in. Here is this U time evolution operator that entangles the system here with the environment. And uh, to obtain the reduced density matrix, we trace out this environment. Okay, so this is the new density matrix after one of these steps that the system has interacted with the environment. We will afterwards do this game for many, many steps and see how the master equation is emerging from, this, uh, from the quantum stochastic Schrodinger equation that we will rep uh, represent in this picture. So what should we learn now in this context? Well, the story sort of now goes on to write this thing. And uh, I guess that most of you have seen this in some form. It's what's called the operator sum representation. So uh, if I write my trace over here, this is my vacuum state, my initial pure state of the environment, a tensor product with the system state as the input, and I have here this time evolution operator that corresponds to this entanglement with the environment, and here we trace over the environment. Uh, let's represent this trace that we have over here as a sum, a complete sum over reservoir states, and I call them EK. They can be chosen, of course, in any basis that you want to. We will afterwards, you know, when the EK has a special meaning, then choose specific states that correspond to certain measurement. But at the moment, this is just an arbitrary basis. Then it becomes very obvious from this that you can sort of pull the E naught that you have over here, matrix element with the U E K here, and define this operator E K. And uh, this whole expression, then this map, you know, how the system evolves under coupling to an environment which we do not observe because we trace it out, is represented, you know, in this form down here. And uh, this is also called the Krauss operators. And as I said, you know, this is uh, operation elements or Krauss operators. And I know that you have seen these things quite often before. And obviously, to conserve the trace here, um, if it is a system which is trace uh, preserving, then we have the property that the EK dagger EK will be equal to 1. Uh, I want you to remember these things because what we will do now in the following is this, that we will take a quantum optical problem and uh, at the end we will try to identify these Krauss operators for a very specific situation, namely we will make many time steps here in the evolution of our quantum optical system coupled to an environment. And then the question is what are the Krauss operator, these operational elements, and uh, uh, these are the formulas that I would like you to remember now here in this context. So this is the case here, of course, of a system which is not observed. We are tracing over the environment because we do not measure it. Uh, but of course, there's a second version of the whole story where you start to put the detector over here. And uh, this detector measures in a certain measurement basis. And uh, suppose that the detector makes a click and tells you measurement value K, okay? 
So if the detector makes a click of this uh, measurement value k, then conditional to observing the outcome k over here, you can ask yourself, conditional to that, what's the density operator, OK? And uh, the answer is that, of course, we have again our initial state over here, tensor product with the system. Then the u over here, this is the big and angle state that you build up at this point. But now we are making a measurement, and according to the rules of quantum mechanics, we have to put the projection operator over here, ek, ek, that corresponds to this measurement. Uh, let's assume this is the, this measurement basis over here. And then we take the trace. But now you realize that this matrix element E0, U, A, K, which is over here, is just this operator, this operational element, E, K, that we introduced before. So the answer is that if you make a measurement on the system and conditional to knowing the measurement outcome, which in this case is simply this value K, then the state of the system, you have sort of learned the state of the system then, or reduced it in the sense of this E, K, rho, E, K dagger. And of course, we have to renormalize these things by this trace here. And if you ask what's the probability of seeing the K here, well, the probability is simply, of course, now the trace of system plus environment to complete Hilbert space. This is the projector on your measurement, and this is, again, your state of the evolution. Of course, it is just now trace of the system over here. Uh, here we just had the environment, and the trace of the system, EK rho, EK dagger. So you can see what's in the denominator down here. It's just these probabilities uh, that we are writing down here. Of course, at this point, you might say, what will happen if I, well, read all of the measurements, but at the end simply discard them by summing over them? Then, of course, your density matrix would be, well, the sum over all of these k's weighted by these probabilities to get these outcomes over here. And if you insert this formula and this one that we have here down here, you just obtained what we had on the previous slide, namely that the reduced density um, matrix, when you make measurements, but at the end you decide to throw them away, it's just given by the one that you never measure these things at all. Uh, so, uh, as I said, in the following, we will be interested in situations like this. And in quantum optics, let's suppose that this uh, measurement apparatus over here um, is a photo detector. And the photo detector can do uh, actually two things. It can either not click or it does click. So there will be two Krauss operators that we will have here. One will correspond well in the little time slots that you have. This photo detector makes clicks or no click. And we will afterwards compute what are these Krauss operators that correspond to that. And then we will repeat this story many, many times. And then you will see that the outcome, and these are certain assumptions behind these things, will be the master equation that we will derive by looking at the time evolution of system plus environment in terms of what we call the quantum stochastic Schrodinger equations. But we have to make clear what the assumptions are that go in there. And then sort of all of the rest of quantum optics follows uh, from these considerations. So this is the point of view that I would like to take. And this is the connection that uh, I would like to make over here. Of course, at the end, we get, uh, as one of the results, uh, the master equation out. But uh, these are things that you know. So the point is not to derive a new result. You know the master equation. Uh, if I uh, presented you for this simple case, and there's these many naive derivations, uh, I would like to give you a somewhat different one from this uh, more quantum information perspective. Okay, so the goal of this lecture now is this, that on one hand we have here this world of quantum operations, and then we have over here the world of quantum optics. In quantum optics we have a system that may be driven, but is coupled to an environment. For example, in our two-level system, these are the vacuum modes, and this environment over here can be seen in two ways. First of all, the system will emit photons, for example, over here, and we might have a photo detector here that clicks or does not click. This will be the example afterwards. And of course, the environment is also the way of controlling the system because you can send in signals over here. We will assume in the following for simplicity that the signals that we send in are just coherent states that can be uh, represented by classical driving fields, but these things are immediately generalized. So we would like to establish a connection between these things over here and then the master equation, but then also this effect of observation on the system and sort of give a discussion of these quantum jumps for, from these perspectives. Uh, but at the end, then, we will do this for much more complicated situations like these chiral quantum optics, cascaded quantum systems, where the same formalism, which is uh, uh, sort of here to derive, to make this connection, is then used to derive equations that maybe some of you have not uh, seen so far. Okay, so that's our goal now here for the uh, first part of this lecture. And we will know, uh, go now in a pedagogical way through these things. This is my usual commercial that if you want to read more details, it's over here. And uh, let's start out by talking about the standard model. You know, I should rather call it the toy model of quantum optics, the system to the environment. 
And in order to simplify the following discussion and really get these things to the point, I want you to think when we talk about the system coupled to an environment, of the system always to be a two-level system over here, because this allows our intuition and our, uh, when we write down these things, uh, you know, to make kind of uh, much more obvious without much overhead in terms of writing. So you can see down here from the physics point of view, if I tell you, well, here's my two-level system, I'm driving it with a laser, what will happen physically? All of you sort of know, of course, the answer that we will, uh, you know, the laser will lift the electron up here. They can be induced up and down processes, uh, you know, reflected by Rabi oscillations. But once in a while, a photon will be emitted. And uh, I guess all of you have seen these quantum jump operators over here. So this is a system, the two-level system, coupled to an environment uh, represented by the vacuum modes of the electromagnetic field. And the most simple toy model that you can invent that sort of reflects you know, this kind of a setting uh, would be the one which is written over here, namely that the Hamiltonian for the total system, system plus environment, this bosonic path that we have here, is written as a system Hamiltonian. And uh, I say, in principle, this is unspecified for the following discussion, but we will always have in mind a two-level system to, to think about that. And then we have uh, a path, okay? So we have a continuum of harmonic oscillators. Uh, if you take a normal atom, this would be a three-dimensional path, of course, but let's assume that you couple an atom strongly just to a waveguide and think of a one-dimensional collection of oscillators. These are waveguide modes, a continuum in one dimension. Uh, to simplify that, so this is just a bosonic uh, path of harmonic oscillators with these commutation relations that are bosonic that are right here on the right hand side. So this is the electromagnetic field that I'm writing in this form over here as a B dagger B with a continuum of mode indicated by the omega and h bar omega. As you can see, put h bar equal to one would be the photon. So this is simply the photon energy times the occupation operator for the particular mode that you have. So what do we write uh, for the interaction Hamiltonian? Actually, what we do for the interaction Hamiltonian is this, that we copy now what we had from, from yesterday with our discussion of these uh, Rabi oscillations uh, in the following way. Uh, let me think about the two-level atom here to explain that. So uh, we said here, we introduced this operator C, you know, which is a system operator, and it's the one that takes the electron from the excited to the ground state. So at the end, of course, when the photon is emitted, uh, this quantum jump operator will act on the system, but that's something to be derived. So we call it right away a quantum jump operator. So C is a system operator that takes the electron from the excited to the ground state. So with this perspective, let's look at this formula over here and what we write down as the interaction. You know, when the system, our two-level system, goes from the excited to the ground state, this is this operator C that we have over here, you know, what will happen? Well, it generates a photon, okay, B dagger omega. There will also be counter-rotating terms, but uh, they're usually weak in our context, and I should emphasize right away, uh, the reason why we in quantum optics get away with the description, I will be able to, under um, uh, you know, these Markov assumptions to solve the system at the end, sort of exactly if you want, is the fact that when we talk about quantum information and so on, we only want weak coupling to the environment. So this dissipation should be weak. And in the case of a two-level system, it simply means uh, here is our optical frequency. The line width or the rate at which you emit this spontaneous emission uh, is much, much less you know, than this optical frequency. The optical frequency is 10 to the 14 hertz, but the gamma, the emission rate, is more something corresponding to a lifetime of something, I don't know, 10 nanoseconds or so. There's orders of magnitude different. And this is the fact, the sort of weak coupling that allows us to do these things. But that's exactly what we're interested in when we try to construct quantum machines, where, for example, this would be you know, a decoherence to the environment that you would like to avoid. So in that sense, in quantum optics, one has to say this is a statement which is almost exact for uh, many practical purposes, and, but it's sort of interesting also to see when it fails. And this is this question of Markovian, as we'll see at the end, but we'll come to this point. OK, so the interaction then consists of a term. When the atom goes down, a photon is emitted, and the atom goes up when a photon is absorbed. This is what's indicated by this Hamiltonian, and there will be a certain density of states uh, out here that we have to write. And uh, let me also emphasize, I'm writing here the symbol B that I will explain now in the next slide. 
in doing our theory, we are not integrating the radiation field from zero to infinity. We only want to include the sort of relevant part. These are the frequencies, you know, that are being emitted. So if I have a two-level system and you look at the light which comes out, it will essentially be at the atomic transition frequency and have a line width given by the gamma. Maybe it's then split by Ravi frequencies. But this is orders of magnitude smaller than the optical frequency itself. So let's only keep the modes of the radiation field that correspond to a certain bandwidth, which I take very large relative to all of these uh, emission rates, you know, gammas and all of that. But I want it to be smaller than the optical frequency. And this gives a meaning to an operator equation like this, where we have a quantized field uh, coupled to the atom over here. OK, so this is the most simple toy model. And let's now continue and sort of focus on the second part over here and make certain assumptions. So as I said here, um, you know, this is my frequency axis. Here's frequency 0. And let me indicate the, uh, the transition frequency of my two-level system by omega naught. So from here to here, it is 10 to the 14 hertz. Okay. So what is the bandwidth that I would like to include? And uh, this is the bandwidth over here that we want to integrate over. And it's indicated by this green uh, shadowed uh, part that we have over here. Uh, we want this uh, B, this bandwidth over here, indicated by this uh, minus and plus uh, uh, theta that we are writing down here. This is the reservoir bandwidth to be much less than the optical frequency. But we also take this thing much larger than any of the Ravi frequencies, the tuning, spontaneous emission rate, and all of these things that we have. So the key assumption behind the following derivation, and this, of course, at the end will be the Markov approximation, is that we have a very clear hierarchy. We have the optical frequency. We have then you know, the frequencies that are these bandwidths indicated by this uh, green region over here, which is this uh, bandwidth B over here. And then we have the quantities like Ravi frequency. So at this point, some of you might get worried you know, that uh, you're, we're introducing here a cutoff. I mean, does my result at the end depend on the cutoff? And the answer is no. This cutoff will, at the end of our calculations, drop out. Uh, and the very simple reason is, you saw yesterday with our derivation of the Ravi oscillations and rotating wave approximation, that what's happening there is this, uh, that the optical frequency drops out. And we can also, in our case, if it turns out, to eliminate the optical frequency. And then we are left with these bandwidths. And then we can let these bandwidths here go to infinity, which is the white noise approximation. So this hierarchy of frequencies or time scale is underlying the following derivation. Um, and this, at the end, of course, corresponds to what we call the Markov approximation. OK, so what are examples for that? Well, it's spontaneous emission. But of course, if I look at the cavity mode and then you know, damped cavity mode over here, this would be another example where the same derivation here uh, would apply. OK, so what do we want to do now? Let's go back to our picture where we would like to look at the time evolution of the system plus environment. And we would draw something like this. We have here you know, a time evolution operator, which is our quantum optical system you know, for the Hamiltonian that we just wrote down over here. We have this input state that we prepare, say, the ground state of our atom. And we have here the vacuum state. And when we propagate these things for a certain time, and what comes out is, of course, the entangled state of the system plus the environment, which is this psi, capital uh, psi t, as indicated over here. So this is the, the map that we have over here by just integrating uh, the, the Schrodinger equation as a system plus the environment. So our goal, then, will be the following one to formulate it. Well, if you got a system of interest, and uh, you got spontaneous emission going on, and this is your vacuum input state, uh, we would like to calculate, in the case that we have no detect over here, the reduced density matrix by tracing over the path or this environment of this psi psi. This is a pure state of the total system that we have in our case. And we would like to trace over that. And let's derive a quantity for this. And this, of course, will be the master equation. But as I emphasized before, we want the derivation that emphasizes the connection with these Krauss operators. So we will construct actually Krauss operators for this. This will be the discussion of master equation decoherence. Um, very often, you know, people think about uh, coupling to an environment as bad. But as I emphasized yesterday, laser cooling or optical bumping or, and so on, I mean, these are actually very useful couplings to, uh, to reservoirs. So you can think about then also engineering this coupling in a way that something useful comes out in this kind of a map over here. And then we can, of course, also look at the situation where we actually make a measurement in the environment. And as I already mentioned again before, uh, in a quantum optical setting, we want this to be a photodetector. And the photodetector in a small time interval either says click or does not make a click. 
And um, this discussion in the following will then give us the probabilities for all of these things, and in that sense, complete counting statistics, but also the effect of observation on the system itself. And this is, of course, what we call quantum jumps, where we then derive in this way the quantum uh, trajectories. But of course, the discussion is much more general. You can also use homodyne detection over here and then have a very similar discussion. Uh, but we don't have time to do these things in this class. But if you're interested, I can give you some notes how all of these things will also work for homodyne detection or, or read this in the book. Yeah. So the next step in doing all of these things is that um, we would like to bring now the Schrodinger equation into a form that for some of you may seem a little bit unusual, but it emphasizes something at the end. We will introduce now here noise operators. And let me sort of indicate what we want to do by going back to the Schrodinger equation that we had at the very beginning. Here we had the total system Hamiltonian. We can write down a system, uh, we can write down the Schrodinger equation for this whole thing. What we want to do now is this, we would like to go to an interaction picture, but it is not the interaction picture that you normally know. The interaction picture that you normally know would say, well, uh, this is H naught, system plus uh, the bath over here, and let's eliminate this over here uh, at the expense of introducing some time dependence. What I would like to do is introduce an interaction picture only with respect to the HP, which is over here, the bath, okay? So what will happen if I introduce an interaction picture with respect to the HP? Well, essentially, all of these operators, I mean, I will eliminate then the HP by definition, it's the interaction picture. Then I have to transform this interaction Hamiltonian here to this interaction picture. But if I ask you, you know, I give a harmonic oscillator, and uh, what's the interaction picture, the free time evolution under this uh, HP over here, you would simply put, multiply this thing here by e to the minus i omega t and e to the plus i omega t. So when I rewrite this equation in the form that I indicated over here, you can see that in this interaction picture, but very special because we only eliminate uh, this, this path over here, you know, we would get the system Hamiltonian, which is unchanged. And then over here, we would get the C, of course, but then we have this integral over the bandwidth that we introduced here before with the B, and then we got these terms e to the i omega t that we have over here. And uh, you can see that these uh, operators here that we introduced, they are like the Fourier transform, if you want, uh, of, uh, of the corresponding B of omega. These were the destruction and creation operators for, for the photons. Uh, this is sort of like the Fourier transform of this thing integrated over certain bandwidths. And we want to interpret these quantities over here as noise operators, because if I write down the commutation relation, well, there's always this optical frequency that goes out. I will essentially have something over here, which is a delta function. And this delta function has the width given by one over the bandwidth of my reservoir that I kept over here. So for all practical purposes, you know, this is operator white noise. Uh, it is a bosonic operator that has time computation relations where on the right hand side we have a delta function and we will see that all of these optical frequencies, we can transform them away because we made the assumption of, uh, of being in a, in a rotating frame. So this is white noise on the scale of one over B. And uh, these are the quantum, this is the equation that you would like now to solve in the following as a quantum noise problem. So some of you might say, well, we made the system here more complicated by doing that, but actually it will turn out that we will be able, under the assumptions that have been sort of listed so far, to solve this equation here exactly, and this will allow us to calculate these uh, time evolutions. This is, you know, the Markov approximation at this point essentially has been made in these time scale assumptions over here. Uh, will allow us to integrate this thing exactly, and then we get the master equation and uh, all of the photon statistics, quantum uh, trajectories, and all of these things at the out just in uh, essentially one shot. So it will be an interesting exercise to integrate this equation over here in time. Um, well, as I said before, we can you know, always eliminate, in our case, the optical frequencies. And so what this means is that in the equation over here, maybe then there's a tilde, like a detuning that we have then introduced over here. It's a slightly modified Hamiltonian. But now we have uh, in front of us a Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation has a system Hamiltonian. And it has an interaction part over here. Where before we said, well, if the system goes from the excited to the ground state, it emits a photon. Now we write this thing, we will interpret this thing as a noise operator, and you will ask what's the meaning of this parameter t, the time that appears, but this will come out now very clearly in the following discussion. So under these assumptions, this is a Schrodinger equation for the system plus environment. Um, it, is, uh, it has a term over here which essentially is a white noise term. 
And if you write it in this form, you can give a meaning to this as a quantum stochastic uh, differential equation, which is a Schrodinger equation, actually the form to be interpreted as a Stratonovich equation. But these are things that um, we don't have to worry about at the moment, because uh, what we will actually do now in the following technical terms is to take the Stratonovich equation, convert it to an Ito equation, and then all of these nice Ito rules will apply, but we will get them sort of for free by just physical considerations. OK, so the question is now this over here. You know, we have now uh, a Schrodinger equation over here. We have these noise operators that appear over here. Let's try to integrate this equation. Yeah? And uh, as I said before, some of you may be horrified by looking at the equation and ask yourself, what does it mean? And so let's try to develop an intuition what this equation means and uh, what the assumptions are behind it. And uh, so what we do then is that we will now integrate this equation in time by subdividing the time interval into small time intervals delta t that we have over here. And then, of course, we can always integrate the Schrodinger equation by applying the unitary operator for a small time step delta t, another one, another one over here, until we come to the end. And uh, uh, you might ask, how large do I choose the delta t that we have over here? And uh, the answer is we will choose this delta t Sorry, we will choose this delta t that we have over here in such a way that my time step that I'm doing from here to over here, one of these very small time steps is such that uh, think of system Rabi oscillations. You know, you have a Rabi frequency and you got your Rabi oscillations. Let us take this time step so small that the evolution of the Rabi oscillation is just, you know, a very small increment. You can sort of discretize these Rabi oscillations in terms of very small time steps, like integrating the time dependent Schrodinger equation by some Euler algorithm, you know. Um, so we want delta t to be much smaller than the Rabi frequency. But at the same time, what we want is that this delta t, as you will see now in the following, we want to be much larger than this cutoff parameter uh, theta that I introduced now here before, that at the end actually we want to go to, uh, to let go to infinity, okay? So there's this hierarchy of time scales, and I will talk about this then a little bit more below. So what I suggest now is to take sort of a naive approach, and we would like now over a very little time step that we call now delta t over here, to integrate my Schrodinger equation, okay? So what does my Schrodinger equation contain? It contains the system Hamiltonian. First of all, this h this. But what are the parameters in the system Hamiltonian? There's the Rabi frequency. Um, there will at the end be a detuning. And uh, let me try to do this integration of a single step in such a way that I just would like to be accurate to order delta t. So it simply means, well, time evolution operator, zero or is one. And then if I want to be linear in delta t, because my time step is so small, I write here h cis times delta t. And uh, this is like these sort of discretized Rabi oscillations that I'm trying to do in my time evolution over here. Uh, what about the other terms that we have for our operator noise? You remember that we had terms b dagger, this uh, quantum noise over here, times c, and then the c dagger b term over here. Um, and then applied, of course, here to the initial condition. And the initial condition was, say, the atom was in the ground state, and here was my vacuum state. So the physical meaning of all of this is that, well, here, this is sort of discretizing the Rabi oscillation because my laser is over here, and my laser acts on the ground state. There's no photons yet over here, and tries to make a Rabi oscillation. This is the meaning, and it's just a small first onset of Rabi oscillation. But then we have these terms over here that are these white noise operators integrated from zero to delta t. This is just the first order. And um, uh, you can see that this will create a photon. And actually, this term over here, this is a destruction operator. This is the vacuum. This term will actually drop out. So this term over here will essentially create a photon. So if your atom is in the excited state, you know your quantum jump operator that you have over here can take the electron to the ground state. And doing that will create a photon in this very small time interval that we have over here. So this is the first step of this time integration that we are having here, OK? So I said before, let's integrate these things up to order delta t. And now comes a very essential and the key point of the whole story, OK? Uh, we want this to be accurate to order delta t. And most of you would at that point simply say, well, uh, let's just take the first line that we have over here, and it's accurate. This is just delta t here. Here is obviously delta t. But the answer is that this would be wrong. And the reason why it's wrong is related to the fact that these uh, operators B dagger and B over here satisfy white noise commutation relations. And if you remember, maybe white noise is like the square root of an increment delta t, you know? Uh, okay, you, you will see it now. So 
let's sort of, you know, keep this term and this term over here and go to second order perturbation theory here. You know, it looks like second order. So all of you would tell me, well, this delta t appears now here twice, so this is delta t squared. Why are you keeping this term? But let's look at this term over here. And I'm just taking now, picking out one term that will be important. I'm taking the b dagger first and then the b here second. What will happen? Okay, we apply it now here to the vacuum. This is this term. This creates the photon. This term has dropped out. And now we look at this term over here. What is the term b of t, b dagger of t prime acting on the vacuum? Well, we can very easily work this out because when I write down b, b dagger on the vacuum, of course, I can uh, subtract from this the other term, which is b dagger b, uh, because b operating on the vacuum would be zero. So I can replace this thing here by the commutator on the right hand side. But the commutator over here, we know, is sort of on the scale that we have here, a delta function. And if I integrate out this delta function, you can see this term, because of this delta function over here, that this is white noise, is actually of order delta t. So we have to keep the second line contribution maybe opposite to the intuition that you had here at the very beginning, OK? So in that sense, what we're doing over here is this, that we are integrating now the Schrodinger equation up to first order delta t. And we have to keep the second line here. Uh, and you can see that in front, from here was pp dagger. So we have a c dagger c that goes in front over here. And here's my coupling that I introduced now here before. Uh, which is essentially this, uh, this constant that we extracted by integrating with the frequencies. So we can now summarize our findings so far by saying, well, we took an integration of a small time step over here. And what is our result? Our result is that we can write down here an Hamiltonian that I will now write down uh, below. And uh, the term that we have to keep over here was then a term. You can see, maybe I just go back to the previous slide over here and uh, emphasize that. You can see that this term over here, c dagger c times delta t multiplied by the gamma in front, this is, an, uh, this is a term that I can combine with the system Hamiltonian because it has no b and b dagger anymore. They vanished because of my commutator, uh, which I had over here. OK, so we can see that by doing this little time step that we are doing over here, we got an atomic Hamiltonian that acts on the initial state. And we got this b dagger of t dt, this operator over here, that also acts on the initial state. What I would like you to interpret this now is this, that you can see that after taking a little time step, two things can happen. Either the atom has not emitted a photon, but just been driven by the Rabi oscillations, or it has emitted a photon. So we have now a superposition state. Everything is still in the vacuum, or one photon was emitted. So you can see what we do here is this. By iterating all of these things, we are building up a huge entangled state where the atom will be entangled with many photons and can be generated in all of these time slots and will be sort of going out. So what I want to do now is this, that I would like to give this operator that we have over here a special name. And I will call it uh, delta p. And uh, for the experts in the audience, this at the end will be like an Ito increment. And we are sort of on the way now of deriving Ito rules uh, for this Ito calculus of this quantum stochastic differential equation. But if you don't know about these things, you may just ignore my comment at that point. And uh, so we can now summarize by saying that, well, we have taken a little time step. We have this effective Hamiltonian, which is the system Hamiltonian. And we gotten now an additional term from the second order, which is i over 2 gamma c dagger c. And what is the meaning of this term over here? If you write this thing down for the case uh, of a two-level system, you know, what did we say in the case of the two-level system? We had a quantum jump operator, which was C. You know, this took the electron from the excited state and back here to the ground state that we called here G. What is now C dagger C? OK, if I write here C dagger C, you can see that this is nothing else but the projector on the excited state. So if I write down my system Hamiltonian, you know, my system Hamiltonian will have a term like, you know, optical frequency h bar omega g. If I write it still in this form, E, E, then you can see this term over here will add over here, and it will be like a minus i, 1 half, and then will be a gamma. Uh, so it is the imaginary bar. And this is the line width that we sort of obtain here. As an, it turns out that this would be an, an Ito correction to the whole story, which we obtain over here. So this is the familiar in wigner weisskopf theory, you know, finite line widths that we get. You just take your atomic transition frequency, you add the imaginary part to the whole story, uh, and this would be the radiative lifetime or the radiation, the emission rate of your atom that you have here. 
Okay, so in that sense, we have here an atomic Hamiltonian, and this is just a Wigner Weisskopf Hamiltonian, the where uh, the atomic transition frequencies get an imaginary part. But we also have now a second term over here, which is uh, the one here, C delta B. And this is the term that uh, the second you know, option for an atom is to emit a photon and at the same time make obviously, this is the time evolution C over here, to make a transition from the excited state now here to the ground state. And uh, this is uh, the operator delta B that we have down here. And it may be useful now for us to look a little bit at the properties of this operator delta B. What's the meaning of this operator that we have over here? So if I define the operator delta B that we have up here, you can see that this is an integral over white noise. And um, I want you to think about this operator as being the creation or the destruction operator of a photon in, in our case here, the first time slot, indicated by this integration uh, from zero to delta t, but here it's written as a delta b can be sort of a photon generated in each of these time slots over here, and uh, delta b is the uh, destruction operator, and if you write delta b dagger, then it will be the creation operator. So we introduce here photonic uh, creation destruction operators that correspond to photons that are emitted in a very small time slot. So you should think of the atom like being con uh, sort of coupled to, to a waveguide, and it can emit, you know, there will be this uh, very small time slot. And like on a conveyor belt, we can sort of, you know, put photons there, but in the sense of creating a very huge superposition states of all of this, and we are in the way of calculating this uh, very huge uh, superposition state that we get. So let's look a little bit at the properties of this delta B over here. And um, I want to derive now a few relations. The first one is this. Well, if I take the same time slot t over here, say the first one, then uh, the commutator between this delta b and the delta b dagger will be equal, well, uh, with this definition over here, just delta t. This is what we used before to get uh, this, this expression that we had down here in this effective Hamiltonian. But let me also emphasize that when you take uh, two time slots t and t prime, one over here and then a distant one over here, then the fact that the underlying integral has here these B operators that are white noise lead to the fact that this thing is equal to zero. So we have the important property now for the following derivation, that these delta Bs that we have over here, they will commute in different time intervals over here. And now I want you to interpret the operator delta B, and uh, if we have to normalize this thing by the delta T that we have over here, and this is now the creation operator for a photon which is emitted in one of these time slots over here. So at the end, when we talk about photon statistics, the photon statistics emitted by this atom, you know, there will be this huge entangled state, and when you put a photo detector out there, and then you ask in each of these time intervals, is a photon detected, yes or no? This is the continuous measurement that one is doing. Uh, we essentially ask, you know, uh, do we see a photon, yes or no, in the sense uh, of these one photon wave packets that we are writing over here. So these are just one photons in this very small time interval delta t that we specify over here. And of course, there will be a corresponding number operator. You can see that this number operator here will commute at different times. And when we say that uh, we are doing a measurement of photon statistics, what we are doing is this, that we are essentially measuring you know, uh, all of these commuting operators. They can, of course, all be measured simultaneously in this sense. You know, photon statistics is measuring these occupation number operators that we have over here. Um, and again, for the experts, delta P that we have here, you know, this would be the E2 rule, delta B, uh, dB dagger equal to dt, if some of you uh, know these kind of things. So this now allows us to rewrite this first step, you know, in a slightly different form, but now I guess it gets kind of more suggestive and more clear uh, what we are doing here. In the first time step, you can see that uh, we apply to the vacuum over here. You know, uh, we will have uh, this line one minus H effective. This is my Wigner Weisskopf Hamiltonian. And this is now according to this operator delta B creating a photon, you know, but at the same time, then there's a quantum jump C where the atom goes from the excited to the ground state. Uh, let me now put in the fact that the psi that we have over here, you know, is given as the vacuum term in the ground state. And if I do that, I can sort of, you know, write here the vacuum state. Well, one minus HI effective, I can sort of have to apply to the atomic state. So this is 
The atom in the ground state, this is the onset of Rabi oscillations that are damped by this wigner weisskopf term here. This is the first time, but no photon has been emitted. Or one photon has been emitted because delta B dagger applied to the vacuum makes a one photon state. And of course, then I have to put in the normalization factor delta T squared of delta D back here, C. So we can see that we have now, after one time step, a superposition where either you know, the, uh, the field is still in the vacuum state, or maybe one photon has been emitted you know, in this particular time slot, and we have one superposition state of a photon or no photon. So at that point, you can sort of go back and say, well, what are the Krauss operators that correspond to this? Okay, Because we're just taking a small time step. And uh, so we can try to read off the Krauss operators and apply all of these general formulas that we had before, um, applied here to derive at the end, for example, the master equation. This is a reminder for you what we wrote down before, but now written for pure state. So we have here the atom in the ground state, the atom in the vacuum state. This was this entangling operator, which in our case was the time evolution operator. And what we had before was this. This was the time step of integration here. And we would sort of expand this thing over here. Uh, you know, the sum here would either be the vacuum or it would be a one photon state. So there will be two terms in the sum over here. And we can then read off what the Krauss operators are because the Krauss operators are just these matrix elements that we have over here. So I can read off Krauss operators that a photon is not emitted or a photon is emitted by just looking at the expression that we have up here. And you can see that these are just these coefficients that we have out here in front. Let me try to do this now. So I want to compare this now with that. And you can see that I'm identifying now here this term that we have over here with the first Krauss operator. This is the Krauss operator where no photon is emitted. And then we have here the second term here, you know, uh, and, uh, which is the E1 over here, where one photon is emitted. It is just the second coefficient that we have over here. So we have identified Krauss operators in our time evolution corresponding to a situation that an atom uh, is in the superposition of having emitted a photon or no, not emitted a photon. And uh, these are now the building blocks for all our following derivations. OK, so let me now take this thing and sort of move on and uh, do now a little discussion by going back to this quantum information perspective of um, you know, asking ourselves, uh, suppose now that our quantum optical system is propagating one of these small time slots. And then we ask, you know, uh, suppose that we make a measurement or we do not make a measurement. OK, so let me as a first step uh, make, not make a measurement of the system. OK, by not doing a measurement of the system, I have to calculate here the trace over the path. So I'm not doing a measurement over here. So this means, according to my general formula that I wrote down before, I have to sum my two Krauss operators over here, E0, E0 dagger, and E1 uh, rho, and then the E1 dagger. And let me just insert now what these Krauss operators are from my previous slide. And when I do that, it gives me the density matrix after one time step where I say I'm not uh, looking at the photons that are coming out or not. This is just a reduced density operator by not observing the outgoing photons. I'm not observing my environment. So this gives me now the map you know, from row 0, uh, then here to the time step delta t. And it has two contributions, the no photon contribution and the one photon contribution. But I can easily rewrite this thing in a form. You know, like in the second line over here, where some of you will sort of realize that this is like a discretized form of the master equation in the Lindblad form, where this operator C that we introduced, this was the operator that took us from the excited state to the ground state. This was the quantum jump operator, appears here in the Lindblad form. So I guess all of you know the Lindblad master equation. We get the Lindblad master equation out from this thing, you know, just by this uh, identifying the Krauss operators after a single step. And I emphasize very much that in writing down this equation over here, there's a hierarchy of time scales which is behind. We were not allowed to take delta t infinitely small. It had to be small relative to the Rabi frequencies, you know, these atomic parameters. The optical frequency was sort of eliminated anyway and went to infinity. But it is large relative to the bandwidth of the radiation field that, uh, that we are keeping in our context. So in this sense, this master equation can at the end, even though it is coarse grain time evolution, be approximated as a differential equation. So at that point, you might actually get a little bit worried because we say that we want to derive the master equation. 
and uh, we're just still talking about the first time step and we have to take a lot more of these time steps and it will tell me that this will take an infinity of time. We will see that by doing the first time step, all of the other ones will actually follow automatically, but there's still a few tricks which are then here behind. Okay, so we got now the master equation out from by identifying the Krauss operators in our case over here. But let me now ask the question, which is the more interesting one. Suppose that I observe the system. And when you observe the system, we have here a photo detector, and the photo detector can one of two things. It can make click or it can make no click. Uh, and uh, suppose that the photo detector here makes click. What do we get if the photo detector makes clicks? What do we learn about the corresponding quantum state over here? Well, according to the rules that we had here before, and this is again written down here, it simply means that we have to write down the Krauss operator for the case of uh, uh, that the photon being detected, but we just derived what this Krauss operator was. It was this operator E1, and it was simply, you know, this normalization factor C uh, uh, applied here to the initial state. So you can see that the result is, you know, if my photo detector does make a click, uh, the Krauss operator over here tells me that uh, this is the operator I have to apply to the initial state. So if the atom was in the excited state, it would now make a jump to the ground state. So we have sort of derived in this context within this Markov approximation, the quantum jump here, conditional to seeing a detection over here, you would then here get uh, what the time evolution of the atom is. And the answer is, if you see a click, you know that the atom makes a jump to the ground state. Huh? This is sort of deriving quantum jumps in this sense from these uh, first principles. And uh, of course, uh, you can also work out the probabilities for making a click. This is again the formula E1 and then E1, there should be a dagger over here. And you can see it goes like gamma times delta T. This is simply the emission rate times the population of being in the excited state. So your intuition, what's the probability of being in the excited state? Well, it's the second uh, term over here. And what's my probability of emitting a photon in a small time interval? It's just the emission rate times a little time interval. And this is exactly what the result is of our derivation that we have here, okay? Uh, and then the next story is this, of course, uh, if there's no click. And uh, you will tell me, of course, or our intuition might tell us uh, initially, uh, if you don't see a click, well, you don't learn anything. But actually, by not seeing a click, you get information, okay? And uh, how is the state modified by not having a click? Uh, the answer is that you have here your state, and you have to apply the operator E0. But what's the operator E0? It is this thing over here, mon minus each effective. Or let's write it like this. This is simply the time evolution, uh, according to the wigner weisskopf Hamiltonian. And uh, some of you may be surprised now, of course, if I have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, what this thing is, it's the Hamiltonian I wrote down here, uh, then of course there will be a decaying norm. But what's the meaning of this decaying norm of this thing? Uh, of course, the sum of seeing a photon and no photon must add up to one, okay? And of course, this object over here corresponds to the subset where you saw no click. And so the norm of this object over here simply means that this is the probability of seeing no click a detector is just what corresponds to the decay of the norm of this wave function in one time step, okay? So the fact that the norm, that this is a non-Hermitian operator, actually has a deeper meaning by uh, corresponding to this uh, effective time evolution over here with a non-Hermitian evolution. So non-Hermitian evolution here, this Hamiltonian is now a feature and it is necessary for the self-consistency, of course, of the whole picture, because otherwise the probability of a photon and no photon would not add up to one. And so no clicks is simply the decay of the norm of my wave function according to this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. So this is kind of a, you know, uh, the analysis where we have identified the Krauss operators. And at that point, you will tell me, well, uh, we should maybe hurry up a little bit because we have to integrate in all of the other time steps over here, okay? We just did the first time step, huh? and we use very specifically the fact that we had the vacuum state over here, where we applied the operator B, the destruction operator, to the vacuum gets zero. It will tell me in higher order that's not true, but you will see it is actually true in the Markov approximation. You see it in the following sense. So let me integrate now from n minus one up to n, one of these time steps out here. And then my argument would be that I have here a delta B dagger, and what happened to the delta B? Well. If I have a delta B over here, remember this formula that I showed you before. Sorry, I have to go back here. Where's this thing now? Uh, no, this was a little bit further down. This is the bad thing about Keynote that you never know where, we, where you are. Ah, remember this formula over here? 
delta B, delta B dagger, if you take different time intervals, these things will commute. So if you have an integral that gives you a dB dagger, it is at a later time than all of the earlier delta B daggers that you generated before. So based on this property, this just commutes all of them, hits the vacuum, and is gone. Okay, so I can just repeat my story that I had now here before, even for all of the other time steps, and now I can generalize all of that by just uh, writing down what my answer is. And my answer is now this one over here, that I have always this operator one minus h effective delta t. This is generating a photon in one of these intervals over here, and I'm just slicing these little time evolutions that I have here together. And it's based on the fact that we have this property down here. Um, so there's a way of formalizing this thing, and when you think about Ito calculus, the Ito equation, Ito Schrodinger equation, is exactly the equation that we wrote up here, except that, of course, mathematicians would not talk about, you know, delta B's and so on. Uh, they show us or prove to us that you can really do an Ito calculus by having differentials, dB dagger over here, and you have this famous Ito rule, you know, delta B, delta B dagger, which is really dB, dB dagger equal to dt. Maybe some of you know Ito calculus for classical variables. This is the quantum version. Uh, but for a physicist, this simply means it means that delta B, uh, the destruction operator, delta B dagger in one of these time intervals together, replace this thing by the commutator as delta T, you know, just is equal to delta T times the vacuum. Okay? So Ito rules follow from very simple commutator arguments that we have uh, in, in our quantum optical systems over here. So I don't want to say much more about the Ito rules, but uh, this is sort of the formal starting point, you know, for some of these developments. This should be a D psi over here. There should be no DT, I just see here, okay? But now what we can do is this, that we have sort of written down, you know, in all of these little time slots. So we took little time slots and the atom uh, field was in a superposition of photon, no photon, and we add another one, another one. We were sort of kind of iterating all of these things. Let me now write down the final answer to what we get for the complete Schrodinger equation, but just integrating this whole set of equations. And uh, we can order now, or sort of reorder these operators uh, that we had. You know, in the following form is indicated here. Let me draw here a time axis. And let me write down here now the big state vector as a superposition. If I keep only the vacuum terms over here in the first line, you can see that uh, if you have the vacuum, all of these time evolution operators would combine into one effective Hamiltonian here. This is a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian applied to the initial state, okay? If you go to the second line over here, you would keep you know, the term, which is now one photon that was either emitted here or here or here. This is the sum over the T1s over here. So you, uh, you can sort of write down, in this sense, the big wave function that we constructed now here as a huge sup uh, superposition where the atom has emitted either no photon, one photon, and this one photon could be in one of these time intervals over here, two photons, it can be, you know, in any time intervals, three photons and so on, up to the n photons over here. Uh, but what we also learned from this construction is this. Suppose that you had n photons in these huge superposition states that appear in T1, but none in the next one, then, then T2, and uh, then up to the Tn, n of these photons. What our construction gives us, according to this Krauss operator, is now that we can write down this part of the wave function over here that corresponds to these uh, emission trajectories over here. This is part of this entangled state. And what's the uh, atomic wave function that gave rise you know, to this uh, part of this configuration pattern that we had in terms of emitted photons? Well, here at time T1, you know, a photon was emitted. Uh, what's the corresponding wave function over here? The simply one where you would start, well, no photon was emitted here, no photon was emitted here, so you just propagate by the first Krauss operator, e to the minus i, h effective t1, up to this point. At this point, you had a quantum jump, this was the operator c over here, and so in this sense, you just chain all of these things. Every time there's no photon, you write down e to the minus h effective. Every time a photon is emitted, you're writing down c over here. So in this sense, it gives you the huge superposition state uh, in terms of uh, a superposition, an entangled state of a certain uh, photon pattern, a photon emitted in these different time slots, and then associated wave functions. And of course, uh, these wave functions over here are just what we call now, this would be a system time evolution, a wave function conditional to a photon being emitted at T1, T2, and Tn. 
So this, of course, contains the whole counting statistics. If you did an actual measurement on your system, observing in an actual experiment that no photon was observed here, but one here, no photon here, but one over here, the corresponding probability for this event, this is a multi-time event, the multi-time correlation function, photon statistics, would just be the norm of this wave function. And of course, this is less than one because we have these non-Hermitian Hamiltonians that lead to a decaying norm. So all of these probabilities will sum up to one. So by doing that, we have sort of derived now the complete photon statistics in addition to the complete wave function, which is a huge entangled state of our system. Yeah? Um, of course, you know, what we do with quantum trajectories is that we can sort of, you know, simulate uh, this part of the wave function by drawing probabilities uh, according to that. And this is sort of indicated over here, and you have, you know, uh, you have probability for a click and no click. So quantum trajectories sort of, you know, come out uh, from this whole discussion uh, as an immediate interpretation of this uh, huge entangled state that you have over here, including this effective non-Hermitian time evolution, but also the quantum jump that you can see over here. So every time a click is observed, we know that the corresponding associated conditional wave function is reduced according to this rule over here, which is just a quantum jump. Now, when we go back and uh, sort of, you know, trace out over, we are not making a measurement at all. Of course, at that point, we get back the usual master equation that we know so well. And uh, down here, sort of a proof. And uh, uh, it's actually quite interesting to do this proof uh, in the Ito calculus way. You know, when you have your trace over B and you have these delta Bs over here, you know, then this term is here because this acts on the left and this acts on the right. What about this term over here, dB dagger dB? Well, if under the trace you take the dB over here, the Ito rule, which is nothing else but our commutator, tells us that d dB dagger is equal to dt. So mathematicians from this equation derive uh, this master equation just in a single line based on Ito calculus. But for us as physicists, it's of course uh, a deeper meaning because there were all of these time scale arguments behind. And for us, this Ito rule is nothing else but the commutator rule for the assumption that the initial state uh, was actually a vacuum state. Okay, so this is sort of one part of the story, and uh, let me now sort of uh, conclude this part here now by giving you some very simple examples, and, uh, and then in the, in the next part of the talk, there will be sort of much more hands-on on, on real physical systems and this chiral quantum optics. I will give you then, you know, some uh, non-trivial applications where we derive, for example, cascaded master equations uh, based on these formulas, which is much less the equations that you know so far. So some simple examples that give you an interpretation of all of this is the following one. Let's do example number one. And again, take our atom here, uh, which is a two-level atom with the spontaneous emission. So it's the Hamiltonian that we have over here. And our jump operator is just given by you know, this uh, GE over here. Uh, actually, this should be from E down to the G. It's the wrong way over here. And in the rotating frame, then it has this form over here. This is, uh, well, jump operator should actually be the other way around. Um, a quantum jump detection or emission of a photon prepares essentially the atom in the ground state. So this is, you know, whenever you see a click, you go to the ground state and uh, the corresponding emission rate in the small time interval is just given by what's the probability of being in the excited state multiplied here by the gamma. And the result, of course, at the end is just the, the optical Bloch equation that we know. Uh, so, but it is derived here by really deriving first the complete counting statistics, if you want, and then just integrating out. We don't observe uh, anything, we don't care about it. Then the corresponding time evolution would be given by this master equation, which is the optical master equation. Example number two, of course, would be evolution conditional to observation. So if you have a photon detect over here that makes clicks at a certain time, what this theory gives you is, of course, what's the atom doing conditional to this observation. This is really what the Krauss operators answered for us. Uh, conditional to making a certain measurement, you know, we learn what the system does. You know, we learn the system is prepared in a certain state, okay? And that's uh, exactly, of course, what our formulas now give you by inserting now this wave function, the underlying time evolution of the atomic wave function, where these damped Rabi oscillations, here was the, the quantum jump, here's another onset of Rabi oscillations. This is this intermezzo or interplay between, you know, one hand, this effective time evolution, if you do not see a photon, conditional to that, you see this damped Rabi oscillation. Whenever you detect, you know, a photon, then you get a quantum jump and you sort of reset the system here to the ground state. And uh, it just, you know, this is the no-click part, and this thing over here would be the click part that would be associated here with this quantum jump. Uh, that, that one sees, okay? 
And of course, all of you are, I guess, familiar because this appears uh, very often now in uh, very different fields that you can also do now Monte Carlo wave function simulations uh, in this whole context. And uh, by sort of repeating on the uh, normal computer, you know, these kind of simulations here, you know, where you simulate uh, these quantum jumps here, uh, is one way of calculating now the density matrix where you simply do on the computer now, averaging over simulated uh, photo detections here to get the uh, density matrix out. And what's the advantage of doing that? Well, whenever you got the quantum system, you know, that has a certain dimension d, the wave function will uh, live in this uh, Hilbert space of this dimension d, the reduced density matrix will always be d squared. So if you're doing, for example, many body physics, uh, very often you can only do a stochastic wave function simulation rather than solving the reduced density matrix directly because this needs much more memory space if you do your many body physics than this thing over here. So this, in this sense, is a very efficient tool uh, for describing this thing. Uh, and so in this sense, this combines very well with DMRG and all of these ideas, but uh, let's not uh, talk about that right now. Let me give you as a third example the evolution conditional to observation and uh, uh, look at the most simple problem that uh, if you sort of naively ask people, very often they kind of give the wrong answer. So let's uh, go through this in, a, in the following way. Let's assume that I have a two-level atom. There's no driving field over here. And I have initially a superposition state between the ground state and the excited state. And suppose that I have an outcome of the experiment that we observe no photon up to the time t. Uh, well, the question is now, what is the state of the atom conditional to this observation after the time t? Uh, well, naively, one might say, if one doesn't know quantum mechanics, continuous measurement theory, well, if you don't see anything, you know, nothing has changed, you know. But of course, the answer is that uh, when you take your wave function, by not seeing the photon, you make the observation of not detecting a photon. So in this sense, you have this effective time evolution. And your superposition over here, which was initially a superposition of ground and excited state, if you apply this time evolution over here, you can see that the part with the excited state has this exponential damping over here. So, uh, and when time sort of progresses and you're not seeing a photon, you're sort of more and more learning that the state of the system that you have is actually getting closer and closer to the ground state, corresponding to the fact that no photon was emission. So, we actually learn in this sense that the system, you know, for very long times is in the ground state. And the uh, wave function mean have this interpretation that it corresponds to our knowledge of the system. And uh, by not seeing uh, a photon which is uh, being observed over here, uh, you sort of learn something about the system. And in the case over here, it is, uh, you know, that you learn for time going to infinity that the system is actually in the ground state. Okay, so. And as a final example of the whole story, uh, it gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, what about preparation of two atoms in the Bell state via measurement? I always call this thing poor man's way of creating entanglement over distance. Uh, you know, we wrote theory papers about this thing about 15 years ago, and uh, Chris Monroe has done a very famous uh, series of experiments and uses this thing, for example, to connect quantum computers together. Uh, let's sort of derive uh, making bell bears over a distance, uh, you know, from the first principles that we just did with our continuous measurement. So what's the, what's the goal that we have to have? So suppose somebody is able to build a little quantum computer over here and uh, another quantum computer over here, and you would like to do teleportation of your qubit from here to over here. In order to do that, I need a resource, and the resource is an entangled state. So the question is, how can I get uh, an entangled state? Well, there's several ways of doing that, either by quantum state transfer and so on. But this thing here is a probabilistic protocol that we can understand based on our continuous measurement. And how does it work? Well, sort of, I give you here the intuitive version. And on the next slide, I give you sort of the mathematical version based on what we wrote down here before. Suppose that I have here a first atom and I have a second atom down here and I can drive both of them with a laser. So the first atom is in the ground state here and also the second atom a certain distance away is again prepared in the ground state. Suppose now that I apply a very weak laser pulse, okay, to both of these systems. So the first atom has a certain small probability of being excited, but also the second atom has a certain probability to be excited, okay? So what happens with the first atom that you have over here if uh, this atom decides to emit a photon? Well, of course, by emitting the photon, we make here the assumption that the photons are emitted on the line going to the state number one over here. You transfer the electron from here to over here if a photon is emitted over here. 
And very similar, if the second atom B that you have over here emits a photon, you know, it would make a transition from here to over here. But if you look at the setup that we have here, suppose that this is the photon emitted from the first one, or then the second one over here, but you put a beam splitter here, so by putting a photo detector, uh, I don't know, you know, was the photon now emitted by the first atom, or was the photon emitted by the second atom, because the beam splitter erases the which part information from where the photon came from. So if I have a system like this over here, and I excite it very weakly with the laser that uh, I ignore the probability of double excitation of the system and only one photon comes out, if a photon is detected, for example, and this photo detector over here makes a click, or this photo detector here makes a click, what you can see that this one over here would produce a state where you have a transfer of this atom from here to here, but then plus, because the beam splitter erased this transformation, could also be the one over here. So if this or this detector clicks, you got this entangled state with the plus and the minus sign over here. So this is a probabilistic way of generating entanglement. Uh, which is actually very useful. So you just have an atom in the ground state, you repump it, you make a weak emission, then you see, well, do I see a photon? But once you see the click of a photo detector, you know, you know that your quantum jump has projected your system into an entangled state. And this is very useful for your teleportation protocol. Okay? Well, here is sort of the uh, underlying uh, theory that, you know, you start in a vacuum, you have excitation by a short laser pulse, and then I go here step by step through calculating all of these things, putting in the time evolution, here's the photons emitted, and then the beam splitter. So basically, this is the derivation from this uh, stochastic Schrodinger equation that would be kind of the proof, you know, uh, of this uh, uh, EPR generation that we have here. So this is very useful because here, you know, observation of a click of the quantum jump, in this case, prepares the bell states, and there's a market for bell states because they are useful, useful for um, yeah, teleportation. And uh, I'm actually finished now, so you can ask, okay? Because the next part is already the Kyle quantum optics part that I want to talk about, okay? So 